Hey, Macro Museum listeners, this is your host, David Beckworth. Last week, we announced an opportunity for you to get your own nominal GDP targeting coffee mug, and many of you took up the offer. If you missed the first opportunity, there are a few mugs left over from last week, and we will keep them available through this week. To get yours, just go to mercatus.org forward slash mug or follow the link on the show notes. Now on to the show. Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Matteo Majari. Matteo is an associate professor of economics at Stanford University and joins us today to discuss global capital flows, reserve currencies, and the international monetary system. Matteo, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, David, for having me here. It was a pleasure. Well, I knew I had to have you on the show, Matteo, when I had a previous guest, Ricardo Rice, and we discussed one of your papers. And he had a very powerful insight he drew from your paper, so I can't wait to get to that today. And that's what kind of prompted me to reach out to you, and you seemed interested in coming on. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today, and you have a rich publication record, fascinating articles on reserve currencies, international monetary system and the like, and the financial side of it as well. But before we get into all that, maybe tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. How did you get into economics and international economics in particular? Well, first, let me thank Ricardo Rice for being so, you know, so insightful and so nice about my work. He is a great scholar, so I, I'm quite honored. Now, where do I sort of come from uh, in terms of economics? I think I really got interested in in the field when I was quite young. Italy went through uh, the EMS crisis in the, in 1992, uh, and I was very young. I was you know 10, 11, but it seemed such a big thing. It seemed to affect the daily life of people. Uh, it certainly affected my family, and it's something that stayed with me for a while. Of course, I barely understood it. I'm not sure I even understand it that well today, but I certainly at the time didn't. And uh, it is one of those formative experiences that kept with me. And you know, I've heard it's actually quite common for other international economists to come from countries with big crises to have gotten into economics through that route. So I certainly did. And then I went through clearly college. Uh, and then academia really started being on my radar quite late in college. It's not common in Italy to want to become an academic, or at least we don't quite know what a research academic is. Very often you perceive academia as, you know, you have a teaching job and then you have a private sector job in one of the liberal professions. So the idea that I could do pure research every day, um, other than, I guess, when I'm teaching, was not something that was obviously available to me. And then I met an economist, uh, Lucio Sarno, who's now at Cambridge University in the UK, who was visiting and, you know, he had heard that I was decent at this. And he really introduced me to the notion that I could do this for a living, which was kind of luck. And that's how I got into the PhD program. I went to do a master with him, uh, and then I got into Berkeley. And from there, you know, I really kept going on thinking about international economics, which, you know, I'm one of the few people that hasn't changed their mind through grad school. I always tell the incoming students, whatever you think you're going to do now, chances are you're going to end up doing something different throughout the PhD program. Although, I, you know, that was not my experience. <laughs> but um, I think I'm the exception rather than the rule. Yeah, so you followed your heart's desire, became an economist doing research. Now, I noticed in several of your articles, you co-authored with the late Emmanuel Fari. How did you guys meet? What's your connection that you're both working on international economics together? I'm still quite emotional about that. Emmanuel, he was a well-known economist well before I came around. So it was one of those people when I was in graduate school that you would look up his website and go like, let's see what this guy is doing now. It was just such an exciting person. And on the job market, you know, I got to know him and we were clearly working on similar things or actually I was working on things similar to his. And we got to sort of spend time together. Uh, And then he was coming off into New York and, you know, we just hit it off intellectually. I think he was just somebody that had big ambition, was interested in a million things uh, in and outside of academia. And it was just fun. But at the core, it was really our focus on the monetary system. We were both very interested in the topic. And we both thought that we understood it very little. And, you know, we had some fuzzy notion out of reading a lot of the history, but we couldn't quite figure out the way we would like to think about it. 
And so we spent a, a long time talking before we even started writing it equation. So for me, it's been, it's been quite a treat to get to know him. And, you know, I was devastated when he passed away, but at least I got to know him, I guess. Yeah, he was a giant. And when I was watching the, all the tributes that they made, one of the things they talked about, he was very generous with his time for graduate students and young people like yourself and made time for them. So you're an example of that. Also, just his, his many, many interests. He, had, he, was, <laughs> he was really good at many different things, right, including this international literature. And I've followed his work on the safe asset you know, literature side, which has been really great. It's been informative for me and my understanding of what's going on. So it was great to see that you and him had worked together, collaborated on these projects. In fact, we're going to talk about that very paper that we were talking about earlier by Ricardo Rice. You co-authored with him in a bit. All right, so the first thing I want to touch on, though, is is a project you have going on. you got a nice website set up. you got data and papers. This project's called the Global Capital Allocation Project. So tell us about that. Oh, so that's something I'm very excited about these days. I guess it, you know, it's been a lot of my life for the last few years. This is a joint work with uh, Jesse Schrager, who's at Columbia, and Brian Neiman, who's at the University of Chicago at the Booth School. It's a research lab that we put together, um, trying to go after a, a pretty fundamental and, in some sense, very old question in economics, which is how capital gets allocated globally. But fortunately, over the last 10 years, we've been able for the first time to provide different answers from the traditional ones. And I think that the difference has really come from a data breakthrough. I would say that after the financial crisis, it became much more obvious to everybody that who owns what around the world, it's a very meaningful question. And there's been a collective effort between the, com- the private sector, the public sector, the official institutions, the sovereign nationals in collecting data. And so a few years back, the three of us started thinking, well, th- there might be a wave of research coming that provides either a different take on old facts or establishes new facts because all of a sudden we can really look under the hood of how this capital gets allocated. And that's really where the project comes from. And we've now written a number of papers. They're simple papers that try to get to basic facts. But you know, for me, they're very exciting. They sort of taught me things that I didn't think I could quite get down to with that level of precision. And it's still very much an ongoing process. I think we're probably at 10% of capacity right now. That's where it comes from. You mentioned the website. I think part of what we try to do is not just write our own papers, uh, but also make this very accessible, make it a building block for the profession. You know, economics over the last 15 years has gone dramatically more empirically, empirical than it has ever been. And part of that has been this big data that has come around, but it comes with its own issues. In particular, it increases barriers to entry for everybody else. You know, we're, we're quite fortunate. We have a lab, we have resources. And part of what we wanted to do was uh, make a lot of the methodologies, the estimates, and some of the know-how easily available. So the, the website really came with that intention. Again, we're still building, but so far has been quite a rewarding experience. Yeah, it's, it's a great website. We'll provide a link to it on the show web page. Going back to the original intention behind it, you're looking at global portfolio decisions, where capital is going, who's investing where. And one of the areas you touch on, I believe, is tax havens, right? And this is in the news. Janet Yellen's talking about, you know, we got to rein in some of these corporate, you know, loopholes, these ways people channel funds offshore. So any interesting findings from that area? Yeah, I think that's, you know, our most recent paper. And, you know, the, the idea that tax havens have gotten very big over time. I've been there for a long time. The idea that countries like the US, for example, have a lot of their equity and bonds investments abroad in tax havens. The Cayman Islands is about 14% of all foreign uh, portfolio assets of the US. So it's one of the major destinations. That, that was all known. What we didn't know is how to get rid of this problem. How to get rid of this problem from an analysis perspective. Like where does the capital end up? And that's what we managed to do systematically. And really what has emerged out of this global picture are some facts that I find fascinating. Uh, one is that our large developed countries like the US or Europe invest a lot more in, in emerging markets in places like China, Brazil, Russia than we previously understood because the vast majority of that investment occurs through tax havens. So to give you an example, if you want to understand how much does the US invest in China in equities and you look at the official data for the US foreign assets, you will conclude relatively little. I have in mind that in 2017 numbers, and it's about 150 billion. That's tiny compared to what they invest in, say, the UK or Canada or uh, other developed countries. 
But if you actually unwind the Cayman Islands, that numbers goes up by 650 billion. You're now much closer to 700 billion. So it's a huge, gigantic difference. What's the gap? The gap is that every Chinese company that is listed abroad, like Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, uh, is actually resident in the Cayman Islands. And so the U.S. investment in those companies get counted as U.S. investment in the Cayman Islands and not China. You've heard a million times of the rest of the world, in particular China, owns a trillion dollar worth of treasuries. You barely ever get to hear that the U.S. owns 700 billion worth of equities in China. And I think the reason is it's hidden away uh, through these tax havens. There was a lot more in, uh, clearly in the paper, uh, but that was really a one fact that took my breath away. I didn't, I knew the data pretty well and that I could miss something that big going on. It came as a surprise. That is fascinating. Now, I want to come back to this when we talk about the U.S. as a banker to the world, if these findings kind of reinforce that point or not. One other last question about this global capital database before we move on to your other papers. And that is there's been a lot of discussion on how it's important to look at gross flows like during crisis versus net. You know, we tend to have a I think we in the past we tended to focus more on net, like looking at the current account balance. But the I know the BIS and others are really stressed. You gotta look at gross capital flows. So does your database help shed light on that question as well? I would say that the the focus on gross flows was around well before we got started. I think it's completely correct that the notion that you would net everything out uh, doesn't make sense the moment you realize that the assets that you're netting on the assets and the liabilities aren't similar, that you might be netting equities versus treasuries. And you wouldn't do that for a commercial bank, and you shouldn't do it for a company either. The notion of netting really came from an old style of macro analysis where risk premium were ignored. So all assets are perfect substitutes, and then it's completely legitimate to carry the net. But the world really isn't like that. Uh, and you know, even among sovereigns, you wouldn't want to net Greece and Italy with Germany. Uh, they're meaningfully different assets. What our work really did was go much deeper than that into, for example, the currency composition of assets. You know, I always thought that when you look at large developed economies and their corporates, their foreign debt is in the domestic currency. So if I look at the US investing in European companies, it's all going to be in euros. It turns out that that's all in dollars. And that's not just the US. It's a much more general phenomenon that we call the uh, home currency bias that tells you that the foreigners really skew into a very particular set of assets that are mostly issued by very large corporations. They're the only ones that they can cater to this currency composition. But that gives you a very different picture, even in big economies, of how capital gets allocated by the foreigners. And you, you talked about crisis. One of the things that I would like to get into is how does this affect crisis? Clearly, the companies that are getting the capital aren't you know, one over N or one over market value of all the companies that exist. They're a very special subset. I don't think we understand that very much as of yet. I'd like to go there at some point. Yeah, very fascinating stuff. And again, I encourage the listeners to check out the website. All right, so let's move on and talk about a related point. And this is the international reserve countries of the world, the important ones. I want to start with a paper that you have written titled The Rise of the Dollar and the Fall of the Euro as an International Currency. It's also tied to this, I believe, capital allocation project as well. But tell us about that, because it's interesting. I remember reading, man, it must have been in 2000s, a book by Barry Eichengreen, how the euro was going to take over and, and become the next great reserve currency. There were even like you know little cartoons you'd read in the newspaper where I remember seeing one cartoon where the euro symbol was smoking a dollar bill, you know, kind of as a symbol of your days are numbered. And that was back in the mid 2000s. And here we are. And it seems very different. So maybe talk about that paper, what you found in it. Great. Yeah, over time, there have been a number of contenders uh, for the dollar role. The yen at some point before the 1990 crisis was supposed to be able to take over. The euro you know, was a candidate. And now we're thinking about the renminbi. But in the particular context of that paper, and also an earlier publication that we printed in the JPE, we had established with the microdata a pattern that we found surprising, which is that somewhere around the global financial crisis and throughout uh, the decade, uh, that came after that. The dollar role, uh, if anything, became even more central than it's ever been. And this is somewhat surprising if you think that the financial crisis of 2007 or 8 was somewhat centered on US banks. So in the specifics, what did we document? We looked at corporate bonds uh, that are held cross-border, uh, excluding the US and the European Union as either holders or issuers. So this is third-party usage. This is the UK investing in Brazil. 
And we looked at what fraction of those corporate bonds that are held cross borders are in dollars, in euros, or in other currencies. And so before 2008, you get the typical picture that you would think. A lot of it is in dollars. The euro is the second biggest. And then there's a very small share in uh, you know, the pound, the yen, and everything else. With the crisis, there's a big shift in these portfolios where the dollar picks up. It goes from around 40% to over 60%, goes to 70% of the portfolios, and the euro shifts down. So this is a big, meaningful shift in global portfolios at a very particular time. And the paper really just tries to document it very cleanly without taking a stand on what might be causing this. But if I stay away from the paper and you know, I speculate a tiny bit more, to me, it always looked like the private sectors or the private markets are becoming even more dollar-centric. And in some sense, you know, if you were a global investor before the financial crisis and you were looking for safe assets, the financial crisis really confirmed the expectation that the dollar is the safest thing out there. It's a currency that appreciated strongly even you know, after Lehman went down. The U.S. kept a combination of monetary and fiscal policy that didn't worry anybody. We, you know, we didn't go with our own spending or trying to depreciate. Uh, so overall, you might have formed an expectation that these assets are what you want in a crisis. Now, what's interesting is at the same time, over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, the fundamentals of the U.S. might be deteriorating. And we're shrinking as a fraction of world GDP. Debt is going up. And so, you know, whenever I look at a situation where the private market seems to be utterly convinced and nothing could ever happen, it's shifting even more into dollars. And at the same time, the fundamentals are not as good as they, they might have been before. Then you start thinking about, well, is this stable or unstable? I know you want to talk about my work with Emmanuel, and that one feeds into that. Yeah, I want to talk about that and the Triffin dilemma and the possibility that the dollar could lose its reserve status. But before we move on, just go back to the Eurozone. The Eurozone is competing both with the fact that the market and private firms are gravitating toward dollar assets, but the Euro wasn't helping much itself, right? The Eurozone wasn't providing a bunch of safe assets that, as an option, right? I mean, could th things have been done differently in Europe to maybe have slowed down that move? Let me start with, uh, with a fact, uh, which I think we established pretty carefully, which is that the Eurozone looks like any other economy and not like the US when it comes, for example, to big corporates or corporates in Europe getting money from abroad. European corporates borrow predominantly in foreign currency when they get capital from the foreigners. The US in this dimension is a huge exception. The vast majority of US firms get exactly as much foreign participation in a bond if they throw it out in dollar or in foreign currency. So that's a very, very different distribution, for example, across the firm sides. In Europe, it's really just the very big firms that end up issuing in foreign currency and getting this foreign capital through the bond market. It doesn't look like the euro is behaving like the dollar in the data in terms of international usage. It's a very different picture. And it's not just in the time series, it's also through in the cross section. So if that was supposed to be one of the big benefits of the euro, we haven't seen it. Now, that doesn't mean that there haven't been many other benefits, but in that particular dimension, it's still quite different. You mentioned the creation of safe assets in Europe. That's a very active topic, particularly now with the reaction to, to COVID. If you look at the Eurozone, for a while, there were even questions about whether the euro was going to be viable, whether there was going to be a breakup. Now, we seem to have overcome that, but there's still a fundamental problem of the architecture. I mean, I mentioned you know, tax havens like Luxembourg, Ireland. Uh, they're clearly big tax havens included in the European Union and in the Eurozone that they're going to need to deal with. Uh, there's fiscal transfer problem. I mean, clearly, we're not going to sustain a situation where Germany subsidizes the rest of the Union, either directly or indirectly through the ECB, uh, forever. Until these questions are getting sorted with better and more stable answers, I doubt that we're going to see a huge rise in safe assets in Europe. There's certainly a ability of manufacture much more than they have. But getting to the status of the dollar it seems like a different game. Okay, Matteo. So we'll have to wait and see what happens to the Eurozone, whether it becomes a viable contender moving forward to the dollar and the dollar as a major reserve currency. Let's move to that paper that we were talking about earlier, the one that Ricardo Rice brought up. And the title of the paper is A Model of the International Monetary System from the QJE 2018 with the late Emmanuel Fari. And it's a really great paper. We'll provide a link to it on our web page. Maybe you could just start off with a summary, a bird's eye view of the paper, and then we'll get into some of the questions. Sure. So first of all, let me tell you where the paper comes from, because it's, um, it's an interesting story. 
you asked me about the beginning, how I got started working with Emmanuel. And a lot of it was we had this joint interest in the monetary system. And we were both reading a lot of the history of the system. And there's just some great work. But ultimately, we would go for dinner. We would be both very excited about what we read. But we would come away with a very different sense of how we interpreted what we had just read. And we realized that, you know, in both our minds, it was a bit fuzzy what we actually meant by the monetary system. How did it work? What was the right way to think about it? So the paper really sort of came out of a desire to clean up in our head a way to think about this big issue. Now, that might not be as useful to other people, but that certainly was useful to us. Uh, So that's how we got started. So how did we end up thinking about it? We thought that the monetary system was really an agreement on trying to generate safe assets. There's the idea that risky assets are abundant around the world. There's lots of risky stuff to invest in, but safe assets are much more scarce and they had to be manufactured. And you know, gold was one option historically, but it became very clear to the world, even in the 1920s, that the supply of gold was just not enough. You had to complement it with what are called monetary assets, short-term liabilities of some government or some corporation. But it's obvious that if they're monetary, they're safety there depends on the future behavior of the issuer. Are they going to inflate? Are they going to depreciate? And so this was an old conception of what the monetary system is that was very prevalent in the 1920s and in the early 50s. I've somewhat gotten lost even in what people think the monetary system is about. I think a lot of people would think it's, you know, the fixed versus floating exchange rates. And, you know, there's some of that. But at the core, we thought that was the issue. And then the question became, okay, how do we want to think about this? What are the typical trade-offs? And we thought about a a very simple setup where there's an issuer and the issuer wants to convince you that the debt is safe because then you get low interest rates and the issuer gets to use these funds for projects that have higher returns. So there's a fiscal reason to do it. But of course, ex post, it's expensive in a crisis to maintain that promise because you would like to reduce the real value of the debt. Now, you might do it with outright default, you might do it with financial repression, or you might do it with depreciation. In the paper, we went for depreciation because historically, the countries at the core of the system tended to depreciate rather than do some of these other shenanigans. And one of the things that we tried to do was map tools into this question. So we ended up using a a tool that it's very well known in the literature and has to do with multiple equilibria, in particular with sovereign debt multiple equilibria. And this is a very simple setup where if I issue very little debt, I'm perfectly safe. Why? Because even if confronted with high interest rates, the fiscal repayment, debt times high interest rates, is still so small that I will decide to behave and repay. But if I issue sufficiently high levels of debt, there might be multiple equilibrium. If you give me low interest rates, then at those low interest rates, it's actually convenient to repay and I will behave, fulfilling the idea that you should have given me low interest rates to begin with. But there's another possibility. If you now give me very high interest rates, Given a sufficiently high level of debt and high interest rates, the debt repayment ex post is too expensive. It's too onerous for me, and I would rather depreciate to lower the debt repayment, creating a self-fulfilling equilibrium where, indeed, ex ante, you should have given me high interest rates to compensate you from the fact that ex post, the debt won't be safe. So this is you know, the Calvo model. This has been around way before us. It's one of the celebrated models of sovereign debt. And we try to adapt it to this situation. But really, from a technical perspective, what we brought in that was new is to think, okay, if that's the world, how does the issuer decide how much debt to issue? In particular, thinking of a country like the US that is big. So he understands the impacts prices as a monopolist. He understands that as he issues more debt, even if the debt is perfectly safe, interest rates will come up. And so he has this very special monopoly power. And we wanted to think about what do you do then? Does he issue too little? Does he issue too much? What are the trade-offs? In particular, there was this idea in the literature that a country at the core of the system will never risk it. It will never try to blow it up because it makes all this revenue. It has this exorbitant privilege we'll talk about. Why would you blow it up? And actually, as you think through the problem, it's very natural that there are conditions under which you want to risk it. What are the conditions? Well, it's you know like all theory. Once you see it, it's awfully pretty obvious. If I'm in a world where... There's a lot of demand for safe assets. So conditional on safety, interest rates are really low. And I perceive the crisis to be unlikely, then I want to risk it. Why? Because if the crisis doesn't happen and there's so much demand for my debt, I get to raise a gigantic amount of debt at very low interest rates. 
and I look like a genius. I, I look like that was the right policy. Of course, I fully understand that with some probability, I blow up the system. But that might not be enough rationally from dissuading me from sort of entering that risky region. So ex post, it looks you know, very normal, straightforward trade-offs. But it wasn't certainly clear to us, at least exante, that that was the right way to think about the issue. Yeah, we were talking about this before the show, and, and this idea that there's these multiple equilibria, multiple places where the main issue or the core country could end up was pretty radical back then when you first came up with the idea, right? Because we're thinking about the United States in particular. So tell us about that, that experience. You know, people were pretty skeptical, I would say, including some of our colleagues. The U.S. had been or has been at the core of the monetary system for 60 years now, has been a very stable equilibrium. And even the mere notion of thinking about U.S. debt as a source of instability rather than the ultimate safe asset is not something that people are used to or want to engage with. And so there was a lot of like, is this a curiosity? Now, if you take a broader view of history, actually, there is no reason to believe that this is going to last forever or that the debt will be perfectly safe. I mean, think of England of the 20s. It was a country with a stellar reputation, very solid institutions, had been at the center of the gold standard for a long time. And, you know, it was supposed to never go down. And then in the late 20s and the early 30s, they decided to depreciate massively. It was unexpected. They bankrupted the Bank de France. It was the biggest holder of pound reserves. And it was a massive shock that people didn't see it coming. So, you know, there's no reason to believe that under all circumstances, the U.S. will be always at the center of the system. Now, that doesn't mean that you want to call for an end of the system or blowing it up next week. I mean, one way to ridicule these arguments is to always make it sound that whatever we spend, you know, $100 million, we're debasing the dollar, the fiscal revenue. That, that's just ridiculous. These are like long-term issues that, you know, you have to put them into the historical context. But certainly the reaction was, this is a bit crazy. And we were fine with it. Um, <laughs> we thought, well, the debate might come. And I have to say, I'm, I'm you know, devastated that Emmanuel is not around to both see it and contribute to it. But it has happened much faster than we thought. You know, we're now in 2021, and I would say that the debate is out there in the public. I mean, there are questions about how much debt is enough debt. Are we spending too much? Are we spending it wisely? And I think if you go back five or six years, these weren't questions where, you know, major economies were engaging with it. You know, the pandemic run out of debt has quickly fast forward the picture much faster than we would have even considered. We're at 100% debt to GDP ratio in a matter of three years or four years after the paper, which I, I don't think we had, you know, any notion that this was going to happen. Yeah, and the CBO is predicting that it will double that by 2050. So 200% debt to GDP ratio. Let me now go into a part of your paper that's related to this. You bring up the Triffin Dilemma. Your model can motivate the Triffin Dilemma. So maybe tell our listeners what the Triffin Dilemma is. And, and also you mentioned exorbitant privilege earlier. Kind of weave those all together for us. I'll try. So Triffin was a Belgian economist in the 1960s. So at the height of the Bretton Woods system. What was the Bretton Woods system? Just to remind you, it was the monetary arrangement of post-war economic stability. It was fixed exchange rates. Everybody's fixed to the dollar. The dollar is fixed to gold at $35 an ounce of gold. It was supposed to last for a very long time. It's a typical thing where economists get together at a fancy conference. We set it up. It seems to work for a while, and then it ends up in a crisis. Now, in this particular system, the crisis came in a form that Triffin had uh, forecasted. So in the early 60s, Triffin said, well, the US will face the following dilemma. Either issues very little debt, so therefore not satisfying the world demand for safe dollar assets, but then it makes it perfectly safe. Or the US will have to stretch its fiscal capacity, make the debt stock much bigger, satisfy the world demand, but then we have to be careful that uh, the system might blow up, that there might be a run on the dollar. And his view was kind of ridiculed at the beginning, again, on the notion of this is the U.S., nothing will ever happen. But little over 10 years after he first put forward his view, actually what he had forecasted happened. The Nixon administration, faced with uh, mounting demand for dollar liabilities and domestic pressure, decided to go off gold. And so we went to floating exchange rates. And actually, Bob Mundell uh, you know, died uh, just yesterday. And this reminds me that you know, in the early 50s, when Bretton Woods was put together, one of the things that it's sort of amazing is the floating exchange rate system wasn't even considered. It was supposed to be the end of the world. And when you look at it with modern eyes, you feel that they were simply misinterpreting the evidence. They were looking at a brief period of floating exchange rates in the 1920s coming off World War I 
where floating was a consequence of not being able to peg. So it was a consequence of complete instability. And so, of course, the floats look like completely destabilizing. They hadn't quite considered that one could have floating exchange rates in a normal country, in normal times, as a solution. Uh, and really, Bob Mandel has been you know, incredibly influential in our understanding of floating versus fixed. And part of the reason why we went to a floating exchange rate system is we understood this wasn't the end of the world. But I digress. So let me go back to the, to the Trifin dilemma. Trifin had, had put forward this trade-off. Emmanuel and I tried to give it a, you know, a theoretical incarnation. One of the things that sort of transpires also is economists at the time thought this was a problem of a balance of payments. It was a problem of fixed exchange rates. And that once we went to floating, this would go away. Actually, in the year 2021, with floating exchange rates, we're still talking about it. And what was the part of the prediction or part of the logic that they didn't understand is that the problem is much more fiscal. Mori Osfer has also sort of wrote, written about this. Uh, it's much more fiscal than a balance of payments problem. It's about the government fiscal capacity and the, our willingness to repay uh, safe assets of the rest of the world. And fixed versus floating has an interesting interaction with this, but it's not the root cause of the problem. The root cause is fiscal. Now, how does this interact with the exorbitant privilege? So the exorbitant privilege, for those of you that you know, haven't heard about it, it's the idea that a country at the core of the system, like the US, borrows at disproportionately low interest rates. It was an accusation levied to the US by Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, not when he was president of France, but when he was the finance minister, saying, look, you have this incredible ability to get away in the Bretton Woods system with sustaining large deficits without suffering for it, because you rig the system so that everybody else wants to buy dollars, and that gives you cheap financing. How does it interact with the Trifin dilemma? Well, the way to think about this is, suppose that you are the country that has this special ability to issue safe assets, and that there is a privilege, there is this special demand. Now, the way Emmanuel and I put it into theory context is we really made it a privilege. We made it a monopolist. So you, you really get monopoly rent. Theoretical perspective is quite different from um, other incarnations that you could give to the privilege. Here, privilege truly means exorbitant in the form of monopoly rent. And suppose that you have this ability to do this, do you want to overuse it? Do you want to risk losing it? And again, the answer is sort of interesting. The answer is there are circumstances where even fully understanding that you have this monopoly power and that you might lose it, you want to overissue and risk it. And when do you want to do it? when there's a lot of demand. Why? Because if you get away with a continuation equilibrium where the crisis doesn't come, you now issued an incredible amount of debt, increasing your monopoly revenues because you did it at very low interest rates. And so that's the temptation. So to, to us, that's why the Trifin dilemma showed up in the 60s when Europe was growing very fast, was providing a lot of demand for dollar debt. And today, when we're talking about this again, because we perceive with China, with emerging markets, and after the financial crisis, maybe even with some world financial institutions, we perceive demand for dollar debt having gone up a lot. And so that activates, in my mind, this sort of trifling margin. Yeah, very interesting. So the relevance for today then would be that the world wants lots of dollar-denominated assets, and we're the main supplier, provider of that, the U.S. financial system. And the concern is that the world wants more of those assets than really is necessary domestically in the U.S. economy for, for full employment stability, you know, price level stability, all those wonderful things we aim for with macroeconomic stability. So there's a tension there. And I guess the concern is at some point we'll respond to that demand, provide these assets, and we'll come to some point where there'll be a break, some kind of shock to, to expectations. Something's going to happen and there'll be a run on the dollar? Is that the fear that there'll be some kind of, or, or the dollar will depreciate? What's, what's the ultimate outcome? That's a great question. So, you know, the way we try to think about it is like a bank run. Uh, the reason why we wanted a model of multiplicity was exactly that when you look at the historical evidence, you look at England in the 20s, the US with the breakdown of Bretton Woods, it seems that the systems are set up, they work seemingly very well for a while, and then there is one big crisis at the end that brings the system down. And the crisis is almost invariably, people don't see it until they're essentially into the crisis. There are these very sudden events where the rest of the world shows up and says, we don't think you're that safe. We want our money back. It was France trying to withdraw money from England in the 20s. It was Europe trying to put some pressure into the, on the US in the 70s saying, look, we don't think you're going to be that safe. We want, to, we want our gold back. And once they demanded, you realize that you've gone too far with the debt and that you're not, it's too expensive fiscally to repay and you have to sort of do something like depreciate. 
So you know, this to me is very important because it's telling us that these crises are very sudden. They're very hard to forecast. In fact, even technically in the model, uh, you know, it's just a parameter. Multiplicity from a technical perspective in economics, it's kind of the embarrassment of the riches. It's wonderful because it has all these sort of elements, but we don't really know how to discipline it. Uh, all I can tell you is there's some probability with which it happens. And at some level, that's very unsatisfying, but it might be close to reality. It might be that, you know, people often ask me, can, can you tell me anything about a dollar crisis? And I tell them, no, I have zero ability to forecast this. I think I'm probably as bad as everybody else. Um, but that doesn't mean it's impossible and we should be thinking about the trade-offs. You know, this brings us to today. I mean, we, you know, the debate is raging on um, how much is too much debt. Should we spend another two trillion? We just spent one. And part of the argument in favor, if one way I read it is, interest rates are so low. In fact, interest rates have been going down while debt has been going up. So why wouldn't we spend it? And I think there's a very valid logic to that. It's, you know, in the context of the way I think about this, that's the good equilibrium. If the good equilibrium persists and demand is high, you want to respond by expanding debt and use the money for useful projects. But you have to take into account that there is, you know, another possibility and that that might occur. And you need to sort of have that trade off in mind. Okay, I want to come back to this, again, to this idea of, of a run on the dollar. But before we do that, though, I want to flesh this one other angle out that you have. And it's actually tied to another paper you've written, but it's also tied to some other literature. And that's the idea of the U.S. as a banker to the world. So in playing this role as the main issuer of you know, the global medium of exchange, you look at the balance sheet of the U.S. economy as a whole, so you consolidate private and public sectors. The balance sheet looks a lot like a bank's balance sheet. So the liability side is disproportionately liquid assets, and then the asset side is risky. And in fact, this goes back to the, your comment earlier about the tax haven. We, we find out we have all these risky assets in China more than we thought. Let me circle back to that original point, and that is what you found with your global capital flows data. Does it reinforce the view as the U.S. as a banker to the world, or does it alter it slightly in a different way? So in the context of the U.S.-China relationship, I think that one reinforces it in the sense that it tells us that the relationship, at least the bilateral financial relationship, and you know, one has to be careful looking just at the bilateral rather than a multilateral. But if I take leave of that for a second, it's a much more of a sort of nuanced relationship where they own a lot of treasuries in the U.S., U.S. residents own a lot of uh, equity in Chinese companies. That goes again towards the banker to the world view. You know, Gurinchas and Ray had done some spectacular work documenting, you know, how over from the 70s onwards, this had expanded and sort of, in some sense, changed nature from pure liquidity transformation from also being debt versus equity. And the particular point that we brought to bear on China also has some interesting legal issues that I'm not going to get too deep into. But what the U.S. residents are buying are these technology companies like Alibaba that are putting together structures in the Cayman Islands to blatantly bypass Chinese regulation that says uh, these strategic companies cannot have foreign equity holders. So, you know, these are pretty shaky legal claims. There's a whole legal literature on this. And it's an exposure that we barely understood that we actually have and that it is that big. It's not just the banker to the worldview. It's also, you know, it reminds me of AIG, where ex post, everybody was like, well, how did we not know this? Well, <laughs> you know, I'm telling you <laughs> about at least this part. So it's sort of interesting. But to go back to the, to the banker to the world, the work that I did on, on financial uh, intermediation tried to use a model of financial frictions to figure out why US banks, for example, would be willing to do this kind of intermediation. So to take on uh, short term debt in dollars that is very safe. It's part of the safe asset creation that is not coming from the government, it's coming from the private sector. And then invest in risky assets compared to, say, financial institutions around the world. And it really had to do with the depth of US financial markets. If you're a country with a very big financial system with low financial frictions, you tend to lever up. You have a competitive advantage in producing these safe assets and investing abroad in risky assets. And that's where that paper was trying to go. The paper with Emmanuel is quite different. We took the banker to the world view, but we took a different view of the world banker. I guess after the financial crisis, it's obvious to everybody that when you mention banker, people think instability. But actually, the term was originally coined by Kindle Berger in the 70s as a response to Triffin, and it was supposed to be super safe. You know, his view was, don't worry about the Triffin dilemma, 
for every liability that is an asset. We're just like a bank. Now, if you say that today, you say, well, hang on a second. You're just like a bank, so you might have a bank run. And that's really what Emmanuel and I tried to bring in, was this notion that the bank of the world might be very unstable. Yeah, and you raised the observation in your paper that Goran Chaus and Ray, their paper, um, I think it was, was it 2007, they wrote this paper, that I think they note in that paper that it, it, the U.S. has gone from being a banker to the world to a hedge fund to the world. It's, it's even gotten riskier and riskier on, on the asset side. The concern is there might be the shock, something that's going to trigger panic and, and run on the dollar. But let me come back to, and, and ask this question. How would that actually play out? And I, I'm thinking of, of several issues here. Number one, where would investors go? One of the points we've been kind of talking about is the dollar is so dominant. There's so many dollar denominated assets. Where would investors go? And I understand there could be some price adjustments on the margin. But this has always been a puzzle for me when I think about like people who advocate Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies. Mark Carney a couple of years ago proposed a synthetic hegemonic currency. But for any of those to scale up and replace the dollar in large, you know, it seems like in my mind, maybe I'm wrong, and I'm happy to be corrected. Where would you run to? Where is the other bank that you would run to in this case? Right. Let me start with one giving a shout out again to uh, Pierre Olivier and Len. Their work in 2007, and you know, after that, they have a series of papers, really brought a lot of these issues. Again, we, you know, both theory and data to bear on the U.S. has gotten so big, gross assets and liabilities you mentioned at the beginning the document have been skyrocketing. So we really have to think hard about these issues. Now to the second part of your question, which is what would you run to? So that one, I think it's an interesting phenomenon that in the paper with Emmanuel, in the, in the second part of the paper, we try to think about multipolar worlds. What happens when you have multiple countries that can compete in you know, being the reserve status? And there's an historical antecedent uh, in the 1920s Barry Eichengreen um, has quite forcefully made the point that if, if you look at it in the 20s, it's not one day it was the pound and then after the collapse is the dollar. In the 20s, you have an example of a multipolar system with both the UK and the US providing a meaningful amount of safe assets uh, to the rest of the world. And actually, an economist, Ragnar Nerske, in a book in the 1950s, theorized that multipolar systems tend to be unstable. Why? Because you kind of second guess yourself. You say, well, is it going to be the U.S. is going to be safe? Is it the U.K. that is going to be safe? And he thought that as people try to figure out which of the two was going to be safe, they're going to move capital very fast between the two. And ultimately, the debt flow themselves might destabilize the system. And so Emmanuel and I wanted to go back to some of that intuition and add more clarity to the mechanism. And again, we spent a lot of time trying to map tools to the question, like thinking about what is the right way to sort of think about this. And we ended up using a setup of oligopolis or competition among issuers under limited commitment. It turned out that from a technical perspective, this had been, this had been already developed. Think about private money creation among you know, issuers within an economy and optimal inflation rate. And it has some very interesting insight. Now, let me try to make them as intuitive as I can. So suppose that you want to think about the US and China now. And China is up and coming, and they start to issue safe assets. Well, what does that do to the system? Well, one thing that you have to internalize is what gives the U.S. commitment? If and when we're going to have another big crisis, and maybe interest rates start to spike in the U.S., what will push us to not try to depreciate or try to do partial default or repression, anything that could decrease uh, the value of these assets as being safe to the rest of the world for domestic reasons. Well, part of what gives us discipline is we get low interest rates in average times. We get to borrow very cheaply, and that's, a, you know, that's the privilege, and that's valuable. But if I tell you now that 50% of that will accrue to China in the future as a new issue of safe assets, no matter what you do, then you might think that this is not, isn't as valuable, and that when the crisis comes, you don't want to behave. You might want to be a more like Europe that explicitly says in a crisis, we have no particular interest in the euro as a global reserve currency. We're going to do whatever we need to do from a domestic perspective. If you look at the ECB over time, they made it very clear that they don't either encourage or discourage the use of the euro, and they're really going to be focusing on domestic conditions. The US is quite different. If you look at the Fed in 08, or you know, the reasons why they did the swap lines, they understood very well the role of the dollar worldwide, and that the Fed had to 
sort of maintain that that liquidity, had to maintain that system functioning. It's it's a burden on on the U.S. On top of that, and this goes to your the last part of your question, there is the idea that once you have multiple issuers, there is an alternative. If I run away from the U.S. and China is valuable, I can focus on China. And for a long time, it didn't seem like a viable alternative was there. And so there's a, there's an interesting question to which I don't think we gave a particularly deep answer, unfortunately, I'll explain why, of whether having only one makes the system more stable just out of not having an alternative. You know, Margaret Thatcher used to say there is no alternative. This is the system we have. People bring it up in the context of 1973, when the US breaks the gold standard or Bretton Woods, there's a brief period where capital starts to look for other destinations, in particular Switzerland. But then it becomes very obvious that Switzerland is tiny from a GDP perspective. It's not going to be able to be a viable issue at the world level. And you know the dollar has maintained its centrality. And I've argued at the beginning of our conversation, if anything, has even increased over time. A lot of economists, or some of us, give a rendition of that event as there was no alternative. Uh, so you have to trust the US again. It's an interesting question. Now, in the context of our model, for those of you that are more technically oriented, the reason why we thought that the answer was somewhat shallow is that it's more of an illustration of an example that this can happen rather than having any strong predictions of under which conditions would it happen or not happen. It's again, the problem with multiplicity. It's a bit of a selection device that does it. And you know, it's nice to illustrate it. I think there's a lot more work to be done there to really understand it. I think hopefully we motivated other people to, to get into it, but you know, I, I don't think we gave a very deep answer. So let me just summarize what you said there. And I think this goes back to the discussion I had with Ricardo Rice about your paper. If you were in a world where you had multiple reserve currencies, you had a, a yuan region of the world, a dollar region, a euro region, and it was in a state of low commitment, so these players couldn't be very respons- couldn't commit to being responsible fiscally over the long run, what could happen is you could have severe financial runs. Is that fair? I think that that's right. And then the comparison would be, okay, that could be a very unstable world in itself. And if that's the option, now, I don't think your paper says this, but if that's option B and option A is the world we have, well, maybe option A is, isn't so bad. Is that a fair comparison? It's an interesting take. I, you know, We didn't end up ranking the options. I think what we wanted to do was give a theoretical voice to the concerns about the multipolar world. You know, the advantages of the multipolar world are somewhat easier to understand. I mean, for example, I think Barry Eichengreen has elucidated them very well. You know, there is diversification benefits. So, you know, you have multiple countries. So if a country gets hit by a shock, you have somebody else who's still providing safe assets. Uh, You have, you know, more fiscal capacity backing the assets. Those are all very valid arguments. What we wanted to highlight is that while all those benefits might be there, there are also possible costs of moving from a hegemonic world to a multipolar world. And the instability that you have in mind is coordination problems. And the fact that commitment rests on, I get revenues out of this. I get, you know, something that makes me behave is I get away with the privilege. If I need to share it, I have lower commitment. Those insights, I don't think were as prominent in the literature. And so we wanted to articulate them saying, well, it's, it's not everything is going to go straight to, you know, strictly better as we go to a multipolar world. There are reasons to worry about that world. Okay. Well, let me ask this question. If history is any guide, would that world more likely be one of high commitment or low commitment? Or is that too hard of a question to answer? I'm a big sort of fan of the historical knowledge on, on these topics, pretty much because it's all we have to go for it. But I think we have to be careful in the sense that you know, history here really boils down to a couple of anecdotes, a couple of big episodes. And they're very useful to study. But you know these events are so infrequent that we really have two, maybe three. And I'm always hesitant to sort of overdraw from, from these events. But you know, in general, I think, to me at least, it's pretty clear we're in a world of limited commitment. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm a native of Italy, so we've faced this problem at least since I was born. You know, I don't know of any politician that is going to run on a platform that says, my main goal is bringing the debt to GDP ratio down. You know, everybody seems to have a good reason to make it go up. And you, know, you mentioned the forecast of the US debt to GDP ratio expanding for the foreseeable horizon. I just don't know that there is a plan to bring it down. 
to me, what might get us into a crisis is precisely not thinking that it's possible and not thinking that we need to have a plan to maintain some spare capacity. Now, none of that means we shouldn't spend in a pandemic. That's ridiculous. Everybody understands that the, the fiscal multipliers are very high during a pandemic. I, I don't know. Most mainstream economists would say it's a great idea to spend for the pandemic. Now, we can debate on how much and what. Those are all valid questions. But I don't think anybody would bring up the role of the dollar as a big constraint on spending one or two trillion to fight off a pandemic. I would bring up the role of the dollar as why we need to have some plan to maintain fiscal capacity for the next crisis. And you know, one of the other things that I wanted to touch on is there's a debate out there on interest rates have gone down, so clearly we're safe. And I think our, our model or our point of view has something to say about that, which is private markets are unlikely to give us a signal of when we've gone too far. It's precisely the multiplicity. Now, it's true that if you look at very long-term debt, that should be pricing some of that. And you know, compared to short term debt, because they should understand that there is this multiplicity. But there is no reason to believe that the market isn't biased in some sense, that this is rational, that they understand exactly what the probability is. Particularly for these events that are so rare, they happen every you know 50, 60 years. Historically, I don't think markets have a good track record at spotting them in advance. The global financial crisis is you know a typical example. If anything, if I look at the empirical work on bank runs. It seems that just before they hit, if anything, credit spreads are abnormally low. Uh, so the markets are signaling the opposite. I think of this as, you know, we might go into a world where people like me bring these issues up. Uh, it doesn't happen this year. It doesn't happen next year. It doesn't happen in five years. So people start thinking, oh, this is crazy. We should ignore it. It can never happen. And that's precisely the conditions under which you might think that the event will finally show up. It's precisely when you know everybody else start thinking, oh, it's impossible. Rates are low. We can borrow whatever we want. Uh, so th that's the way I think about it. Now, unfortunately, it also means it's difficult to falsify the theory, which you know makes the theory have less of an empirical bite, which is a problem. But I'm not sure it makes it wrong. It's just very hard to test these kind of things. That's a great observation. The uh, bond market did not predict a great inflation. A lot of events it didn't predict. So we need to take those inflation forecasts coming from tips and break-evens with a grain of salt and have some humility in interpreting them, knowing that they might be good for small changes, but these big swings, they don't have a great record, track record. So, Yeah, or at least we should, you know, we want to worry that if we rely on them too much and sort of, you know, they're going to tell us when it's time to tighten. On the other end, I'm sure you're aware, there's been a gazillion predictions of the dollar demise in the last 30 years, none of which have pan out. So, you know, I think that the truth is somewhere in the middle. I'm not sure that, you know, me, or well, I don't want to speak for the profession, but certainly for me, I'm not sure that I would have anything intelligent to say quantitatively to make predictions. I have no reason to believe I'll be any good at it. Well, let me throw out one more argument why I think, you know, this dollar run may be harder than, than we think. I'd love to get your response to it. And that is just kind of a network effect story. So you mentioned, you know, several times on the show how the dollar's reach has just grown, 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 grown. You know, the banker to the world role has just grown, grown, grown. And as you mentioned, during crisis, people actually issue more dollar liabilities because it has a lower convenience yield, lowers the cost of financing. I would argue the, the Fed, when it stepped in in 2008 and in last year, it backstopped the dollar shadow banking system. It effectively set a signal, hey, it's okay to hold dollar assets on the margin. And so it, it kind of reinforces this dollar network. So to the extent this dollar network is, is slowly growing over time, might that not increase the cost of breaking from it? I mean, at least increase the, the odds that we stay with the dollar longer than otherwise would be the case? I think that that's a fascinating question. So let me disclose something, which is, you know, Emmanuel and I were actually working on this, and you know, we're, unfortunately, we're not going to get to write the paper together. Uh, but it's something that we were thinking in a slightly different form, rather than thinking about actual networks. So, you know, a lot of the literature had in mind: if everybody uses the dollar, this might be self-fulfilling. We were thinking about more stickiness coming from expectations, so from a form of extrapolative expectations. So, we had in mind the following: you know, in 2008, you see the dollar appreciating after Lehman goes down. That's pretty extraordinary. That's you know, in some other work I call that one the reserve currency paradox. So the idea that you know the dollar appreciates even when the shocks are bad for the U.S. in the first place. And you know, as an older, you start thinking this is great. This is super safe. 
even when they get a big banking crisis, the dollar appreciates, I'm going to move even more towards dollar. And you might overdo this. There might be an element of that that is rational. You're learning about the institutional quality of the Fed and the US uh, government, but you might overdo it. And over time, you know, you hear that uh, there are problems with the US, that the crisis should be happening, and they don't happen. And every year that passes, you form even more stable of an expectation that the dollar is super safe. Now, for the garden variety shocks, this actually works. Why? Because if everybody else flights to the dollar when a small shock occurs, uh, that flight puts pressure on the financial system and makes the dollar appreciate, making you even stronger your view that the dollar is super safe. But ultimately, you're going to end up with a major crisis. Why? Because at some point, the expectations are very far out of line with the rational expectations, with the true situation of you know, the fiscal capacity of the government. So this is all very loose, you know, for anybody who's listening to this and is a theorist, I, I apologize deeply. This was sort of, you know, think of it as a coffee conversation of things that we were fascinated about that might be true or we might be able to make them work out uh, in a paper. But we really thought about the self-reinforcing cycles of expectations. And there's an empirical literature, you know, in, in finance, like Andre Schleifer has, wrote, has written a whole bunch about this for stocks that might apply very strongly to these, you know, big events that occur very infrequently or which you form expectations over time by looking at smaller things that are going on. I'm fascinated by that. I, I mean, I, I wish we had time to write that paper. It's an interesting idea. Again, I don't think it's very testable, which is one of its shortcomings. But you know, very often we're thinking about the monetary system and big crises. Testable is not exactly the world we live in. Uh, it's more about trying to ex ante or ahead of time, think about what the risks are. And hopefully when the shocks come around, we will have at least a a baggage of knowledge that we've accumulated over the years to face them. That's what we are, at least. Okay, Matteo, this has been a fascinating conversation. We're nearing the end of the show. And I have to ask you this, this question that haunts me, I think about all the time. I've asked other guests, and, and you're the perfect person to do this since you're a, a theorist, international money guy. You think about these issues long and hard. But if we could rerun Earth's history, say, a million times, with slight little perturbations here and there, would we end up with a single kind of dominant reserve currency like the dollar or the pound previously? Do we have any sense of where this experiment would take us? It's a great question. And, you know, I think the answer is probably no, in the sense that I don't think our models are really giving us a strong sense of whether we should have one country, two countries, three countries. I think there are reasons to believe that we're not going to have a situation with 10, 15 countries providing safe assets. There's enough forces that sort of are self-reinforcing to select a few players, but whether that it's one versus two or three, I don't think are, you know, I have a strong view on which way we're going to end up. And we've seen the UK and the US dominate. We've seen a period with both the US and the UK being part of the system. I don't think we have a strong reason to discriminate between one versus two or three. Um, I think the, force, the self-reinforcing forces are probably big enough that we're not going to get 10 or 15. That's probably what I, what I feel most comfortable. Okay. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Matteo Majori. Matteo, thank you so much for coming on the show. Fantastic. Thank you for having me, David. It was a pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.